by faith. My, what an exciting program. A partnership with God, asking God by faith to place a family in the pathway of your family, a family that you'll get into the membership of your church. It's an exciting program. The exciting thing about it is it works. You see, God's concerned more than we are. We ask God for a family, and God knows exactly where that nearest family is. Now, are you involved yet in families by faith? If not, when the invitation is given, why don't you uh, go forward and kneel at that altar and uh, put your name on that little card where you make a covenant with the Lord. Lord, by faith we ask you for. By faith we trust you to place a family in the pathway of our family, a family that will get into the membership of our church. You make that covenant. we like you to make it at the altar. Uh, not that uh, you should go and pray about all your sins. Uh, I am sure that's taken care of. This is a covenant. We're not going to ask you to do anything in this program. Not going to ask you to knock on some strange door where you might feel embarrassed. You might be a person that feels, I can't talk to people openly and publicly. Well, in the program of Families by Faith, you can still become involved just by faith. Asking God to do the job for you. Asking God to place that family in the pathway of your family. Well, we've had two series already. Now, we've talked about divine providence. What is that? God working out all the details. Uh, let me give you a little example. I was uh, leaving Casper, Wyoming. I'd been in a service there. I'd been preaching a conference, and uh, the weather was bad. Uh, as I neared Denver, Colorado, it began to snow. I had a past across in uh, uh, southern Colorado before getting into New Mexico and then down into Texas, and I was rushing trying to beat the snow, and it began to get heavier and heavier. I passed through the city of Denver, Colorado, headed on south, and the snow began to get heavier, and, and I thought, oh my, I'm going to be caught out in this snowstorm. I was in the motorhome, and of course it's limited how fast you can go, but I certainly wanted to make it. And suddenly in front of me, I spotted a little car on the side of the road, a little compact car, I believe it was a little Honda. And the hood was up, and I could just see the dungarees uh, of the person as the rest of the body was hidden under the hood. And I thought, my, my, here's somebody having trouble, and maybe in the middle of a snowstorm, I had better stop. And so I did. I stopped the car, the motorhome, backed up to the little vehicle, and uh, offered my... Uh, assistance, and lo and behold, were three young ladies. They'd been to Denver shopping for Christmas, and now we're headed for home, and uh, their little car had broken down on them. Well, I have a soul-winning tool in my motor home. It's called a tow bar, and when I help folks, if I can't help them on the side of the road, uh, then I tow them into the next city, and while towing them in, it gives me opportunity to talk to them. Well, this happened in this case. I asked the, uh, the oldest of the uh, ladies, uh, I'm supposing she's about 25 years of age, uh, uh, what seems to be the problem? And she said, oh, I I'm sure the camshaft is broken. Well, now, that didn't sound uh, like she knew. Uh, she wasn't old enough, really, I, I didn't think, to know something about a camshaft. Uh, but sure enough, she was right. Uh, she had had problems with it before. It was the same thing, and, and uh, it was not functioning. And so I told her, I said, well, we can do two, uh, one of two things. I can take the three of you into the next town, uh, and it happened to be the town where they lived, or I can hook up the tow bar, if you'd like, and uh, tow you into town. And oh, they were so delighted. They didn't want to leave the car on the side of the road in a snowstorm. And so in a few minutes, I had it hooked up. We were started in toward their city. And uh, then I asked them that question I always ask. Uh, Do you know what divine providence is? Well, divine providence is God working out all the details. After talking to them just a little bit, I discovered they both were uh, religious. Uh, they had a religious background. Uh, uh, they were Mexican-Americans, and uh, uh, their background was Catholic. But, you know, it makes no difference what the religion is. We should tell them about the plan of salvation. Well, a short while I talked to them about divine providence and how God works out the, uh, the circumstances where people can be saved. And when dealing with a Catholic, I find them very easy to win. For you see, they already believe just about everything they need to believe. They believe in the virgin birth. They believe in the Bible. They believe in Christ. All of that. They just lack one more final step. And so I asked them, would you, uh, have you ever had anyone show you from the Bible how you make your own personal peace with God? 
And of course, they studied about it. No, I don't. No, we've never had that happen. Would you let me? And uh, they were willing. And so again, with the Bible on the steering wheel of the motorhome, driving along in a snowstorm, I-, I presented to them that final step, that step of coming to Christ personally, uh, believing in Him and asking Him. And then in a moment, uh, uh, they prayed that prayer. And I'll never forget the young lady, the oldest, about 25 years of age, maybe, uh, in the passenger seat. And so uh, I said, uh, would you like to ask the Lord to save you? And she did. Uh, oh, it was thrilling. And uh, then uh, I talked to the other two back in the, on the little couch in the motorhome. Oh, what about you two? And they sort of hesitated. The young lady in the front said, oh, she said, go ahead. It's wonderful. And so uh, they did, one by one. All three of them accepted the Lord. By that time, we were getting into the city where they lived. And I asked them the question, how far do you live from the freeway? And uh, they said, well, it's just a few blocks. So I said, well, give me directions and I'll go ahead and deliver you home. Because at this time, snow was already four or five inches deep. And uh, uh, so I delivered them home, pulled up in front of the house. And there the father was out in the garage working. And of course, it must have been frightening, a big motor home pulling up and his little car behind it and the girls, his girls. So I uh, jumped out of the car and rushed up to sort of assure him. And I said, sir, I found your kids out on the side of the road, broken down, and I thought I'd better bring them home to you. I said, I have a daughter about the age of your oldest daughter here, and uh, I knew you'd appreciate a little help along the way. Oh, they were so delighted. In fact, invited me in the home. They had had a lunch, and they uh, prepared for me a fine Mexican dinner. Oh, we had a glorious time of fellowship in the home and an open invitation to go back whenever passing through that city. Now, what brought it all to pass? It was that divine providence. Divine providence. God working out the details. Well, he'll do it for you. You make the covenant. You ask God for the family. And in his divine providence, he'll work out the details to have you at the right place at the right time when that other family will come and cross your pathway. And then we talked about the working of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how the Holy Spirit does work. You'll have that uh, feeling in your soul and in your heart. You'll see a family approaching and you'll say, Is it possible this could be my family? Oh, uh, the Spirit will begin to bear witness with your spirit. and uh, Or maybe you'll be driving along and suddenly God will lay somebody upon your heart. And you'll think of somebody nearby that you haven't seen in a long time. And it might be that very one uh, uh, that uh, God wants you to reach. We had a lady in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, she was concerned. And suddenly God placed upon her heart a lady friend of hers. Now, they'd had some ill words uh, some way or other. Uh, It'd been about a year since they'd talked to one another. But God laid that person upon her heart, and uh, she had made the covenant, asked God for a family, and, and she began to pray about that person and decided, I ought to give her a call on the telephone. But did you know before she could make that call... Uh, the telephone rang in her own home and she answered it and it was that lady on the other end. You see, God works in wonderful and marvelous ways in His divine providence. And that lady on the other end of the phone said, it's been a long time, said, I I just wanted to call you and ask if you'd come by and pick me up and take me to church with you uh, this next Sunday. You know that not only the renewing of a friendship and getting back together, but now she had her family that she had asked God for. Well, divine providence, the working of the Holy Spirit. Now we want to talk to you about the next segment uh, that makes this program work, the involvement of people. I want you, if you have a Bible, to look with me. I'll read it to you. Perhaps later you can look it up and read it. But in the book of Acts and in chapter number 10, there's a very interesting story that's going to illustrate this next step of uh, families by faith, the involvement of people. Let's begin. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And if you'll notice, there's no S there. Always means continuously, always praying to God. Here is a good man. My, he's such a devout man. He fears God. He prays. He gives to the poor. He does all of that. Verse number three goes like this. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, uh, 
uh, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now, here's a man we'll discover in the Bible who is not saved, and yet he's an awfully good man. He fears God. He believes in God. He's just never had anyone show him what he must do. Now he prays to God, and God hears him. Here's God listening to a sinner pray. He's concerned. He's a good man. Of course, God's concerned about him. So he tells him what to do. Verse number 5 says, Now send uh, men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And uh, he lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now notice what's happening here. Here's a man that's a good man. Sort of reminds me of the average American husband. Uh, this was a family man here. Uh, he believed in God, as most American men do. Most family men do. Uh, he had religion. He gave to the poor. And most of our people of our country are very charitable. Well, this man pretty well represents, uh, with his family, the average American family. And I mean all the way. For you see, with all of this, he still wasn't saved. Now, what's God going to do? He's concerned about it. He's praying. He's, he's interested. Uh, he just doesn't know what to do. Now, God sends the angel. But the angel can't tell him what to do. No, you see, God in his program has reserved this for people. The involvement of people. You've asked God to place a family in the pathway of your family. Well, you're just one of those that God wants to use. He can't use an angel, but he can use you. Now you've asked him to place the family in your pathway, so in his divine providence, he's going to work out the details uh, so that your path will cross the pathway of that family. Now, how's he going to do it with this man? Send down to Joppa, and there's a man down there. And so the man does as instructed. He sends three of his servants down and finds his house by the seaside and the house of the tanner, and uh, they're there to seek a man uh, by the name of Peter. But you know, God has to work with Peter also, just like he's going to have to work with you. You're going to have to have a willingness. At this particular time, Peter would not dare go to a Gentile home. And this man's a Gentile. But uh, the Lord has to deal with Peter. And if you'll study this particular chapter, this is where the Lord lets down the sheep from heaven with all sorts of beasts in it and tells Peter to kill and eat. It's an illustration for Peter. And oh, he said, no, I'd never eat anything unclean. You see, he considered the Gentiles not part of the program of God. They were unclean. But friends, I tell you, uh, the Lord died for the sins of the whole world. Not just for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That means every person, regardless of background, color, whatever it might be, God's concerned about them. And so the Lord has to deal with Peter and make him willing. Well, uh, after it's all over, uh, the Lord tells Peter, now there'll be a knock at the door. And when these men come, I want you to go with them, nothing doubting. And so, about that time, the knock comes at the door, and uh, uh, they inquire, and Peter goes down, and they tell him the story. Uh, we're, we want you to come back uh, uh, to talk to this man by the name of Cornelius. He's a leader in our country. He's, he has the Italian band there, and, and uh, he's had this vision, and, and uh, God uh, has uh, impressed upon him to send for you to come and tell him uh, what he needs to know. Now, I'm going to pick up the story in the Bible as he gets there and show you what happens. Now, in the next chapter, verse 12, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Uh, moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. Now, the man only sent three. That means that Peter took three with him. Perhaps he was a little fearful. And so he, had, he made sure that, you know, he had everything covered. He had three of his own men with him. Well, anyhow, all six of them uh, got there. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Now notice what happens. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now this next verse is the key. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? You see, here's a man. He's a good man. Oh, he's a devout man. One that fears God with all of his house and he gives to the poor and he's constantly praying to God. He's a good man, but he's not saved. You see, there's something he must do. Something he needs to know. 
And so, as the story progresses, uh, and as Peter uh, narrates the rest of it, he said, well, we went, nothing doubting, and we entered into the man's house, and he told us what had happened, how that uh, he was to send for us, and we would give him words. You see, friend, there's the key. Most people don't know the words. Oh, most people are good and honest and sincere, and they intend to go to heaven. They don't intend to die and go to hell, but most of them are. Oh, uh, listen to me, friend. Uh, uh, we need to get the word to them, and God has just chosen that men uh, should give that word unto them. Uh, you'll have to be that person. God must have a person. The involvement of people. The Lord using people. Well, in this case, it's going to be Simon Peter, and he goes in there, and there are certain words uh, that uh, he's going to be using. What are those words? Well, in the book of Romans, chapter 10, we find a perfect example. And if you use this passage in dealing with the religious person, you can take them directly to that passage where the Bible says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth. You see, words have to be uh, used, spoken with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture said that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. <clears throat> For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. But there were the words. So God is going to have to now use people. Would you let him use you? Would you make that covenant and say, Lord, by faith we want to ask you for, by faith we're going to trust you to place a family in our pathway. And then let God work out the details, divine providence. Oh, when the time comes, you'll recognize uh, the Spirit of God bearing witness with your spirit, and then you will be the one. How's it going to happen? Let me give you a little illustration of how it may happen. This happened to me. I landed in Phoenix, Arizona. I'd landed at the Deer Valley Airport, just north of town. The pastor had picked me up. Bad weather was coming, and so I arrived a day early. Most pilots do that. If the weather's bad, you leave a little early. And so I was there one day early. By accident? No, God in His divine providence is now going to work out some details because there's somebody in that city He's so concerned about. And so the pastor told me, took me to the motel where I was to stay. And he said, now, Brother Williams, I... I uh, know you're tired from the flight, and uh, I'll not be able to see you tonight. This is our visitation night, for it was Tuesday night. And he said, uh, you just rest at the motel, and I'll pick you up for breakfast in the morning. I talked to him. Brother Charles Baden was his name. And I said, uh, I'm not so tired. Uh, why don't you send some men after me, and uh, I'll just go out on visitation with your church tonight. Uh, but I'd like to visit with you personally, and then between calls, we can line up the program for the conference. And so we decided to do that. And they sent men after me about the right time to get me there for visitation. And I arrived at the church. It's visitation night at the church. And, oh, you know how it goes in a church at visitation. Uh, everybody's standing around and one saying, uh, let's you and I go out together tonight. Two by two, they'll go. And, and they're choosing up partners. Suddenly, somebody in the back of the room said, oh, I want to go with Brother Williams. But the pastor had already made the commitment for us to go together. And he said, no, he said, uh, I'm sorry, but Brother Williams and I are going to go tonight because we need to plan the conference. And then he stopped and turned to the secretary and said, get me the card on the biology teacher. Suddenly he realized Brother Williams would be with him tonight and Brother Williams would be a good one to deal with the biology teacher in the local high school. The card had been turned in, but it was not with the other cards. It had been filed away, sort of, sort of hidden away. The visit had not yet been made. Why? Well, it appeared it was going to be a hard visit, and uh, he certainly wanted a, a little bit of help, uh, uh, maybe some uh, study or something, but now suddenly uh, the Holy Spirit is working, lays it upon his heart, get the card of the biology teacher. Divine Providence has us there together uh, one day early in order that this visit might be made and that I might be there uh, on the visit. And so we started out. I didn't want to visit the biology teacher either. You know, if you're going to visit a biology teacher, probably has a master's degree if he's teaching at a high school, and it was a, a city high school, and you'd like to sort of look up some of the scriptures and put some marks in them in your Bible so you'd be ready for some anticipated questions. And then we started out, and I thought, my, my, he's put this off. He shouldn't have done that. Now he's taking the easy way out. Well, I'd had the privilege of heading up a Bible college at one time, and Personal evangelism was one of my subjects. 
I used to teach our young men as they'd go out two by two, I'd say to them, now, I only want one of you to do the talking. I want the other to be the prayer partner. You see, folks, it's not fair when we gang up on people. Only one should ever do the talking. The other should do the praying. And then I tell them, when you see the first one in trouble, then you come in. But then I want that first one to become the prayer partner. Just don't uh, gang up on a person. Uh, you be considerate of their feelings, and, and uh, you'll have a great deal more success. So as we were driving along, in my mind I was thinking, well, I guess he needs one more lesson, and here's what we'll do. I'm going to let, uh, uh, I'll let him be the uh, one to do the talking tonight, and I'll be the prayer partner. The thing is, though, he didn't know that. Now, we arrived at the home, knocked at the door. I told him while we were waiting for the answer to the door, I said, now, you make the first part of the visit, the social part, uh, and then at the appropriate time, I will come in uh, and begin to talk. The thing he didn't realize was that I didn't think there'd be an appropriate time. I'm just going to let him make it himself. Uh, he needed one more lesson in personal evangelism. Well, the man came to the door, saw us, invited us in. Oh, uh, the pastor introduced us, and, and he said, Oh, yes, he said, I've been expecting you to call. Well, that was sort of a surprise. He said, You're young people. And he began to talk about the young people of the church. He said, Oh, you have a great young people, uh, people's group in your church. He said, They've been talking to me. and been talking to me about being saved. Been talking to me about the church. Told me they'd turn my name in and that one of these days I could expect you to come by and make a visit. And so he said, I've been expecting you because you're young people. He said, they're a fine, fine, wonderful group of young people. And he said, and they've done a lot of talking to me also. And he said, I'm glad you came by tonight. He said, I just felt, he said, I figure it's about time I ought to get saved. My, there it was. Here was the one that uh, he had feared uh, the card that had been filed away. He'd been afraid to make the visit. But now suddenly, the appropriate time, God in his divine providence had us there. A man's heart was hungry, and, and oh, we knelt there in the home, and the pastor of the church led this man to Christ. And you know, I never opened my mouth, not one time. But you know, God has to use people. And had I not arrived in that city one day early, that man would not have been saved that night. But of course God knew that. And yet, I didn't say anything, but without my presence, that visit would not have been made. Now what am I trying to say to you? God in His divine providence will use you. You may not have to say anything, but God can use you to sort of set up the program, sort of arrange everything so that uh, uh, the Word can be presented. You may not say the Word, you might just turn in the card, or you might be the prayer partner, but without you it would not be done. Might be that one where you've been concerned and you've said to somebody, would you go by with me and help me make this call? And maybe they'll do all the talking. Well, God in his divine providence worked out all the details that night. Well, Sunday when I preached, this man came forward and joined the church. And after the service, I talked to him out in the vestibule. And he said, you know, when you came by the other night, it was all so simple and so easy. He said, when you left, he said, I wasn't sure I really had it. But he said, by next morning when I woke up, I knew I had it. And I said, I, I went to school, and I'm also the assistant coach. And I saw the coach, and I said, hey, coach, I want to have lunch with you today. And so I, he was quite a ways off from him, so he just waved his hand and said, okay, we'll have lunch together. And he said, and then I had basketball practice as the assistant coach. And he said, I lined up all my fellows, and I asked him, how many of you fellows been saved? he said, guess what? All but four of the fellows are already saved. My, wasn't that a good report. My heart thrilled as I realized the man had just been saved himself, and now he's concerned already about others. Well, the conversion was real. It was so simple, it seemed to him, yet God had worked behind the scenes. It wasn't simple at all. Or oh, there had been a, a bad weather that had caused me to leave a day early, and I'd arrived in the city a day early, and there was that visitation program, and, and the pastor and I going together, and somebody else wanting to be involved, and then suddenly the Spirit of the Lord dealing with the Spirit of the pastor about that particular card that had been filed away. Now all of a sudden, in His divine providence, everything had been worked out, and our paths crossed, and here was a man who found Christ. Just sort of like the story in the Bible. Divine providence works out the details. You think God can't do it? Friend, you get involved in this program by faith, 
Oh, what is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Did you know, friend, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please Him or to please God. It goes on to say that we must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Families by faith. Pray. Make the covenant. Say, Lord, by faith I want to ask you for it. By faith I want to trust you to place a family in the pathway of our family, a family that we will get into the membership of our church. Well, here it is, the involvement of people. Let me illustrate again. I was in Pontiac, Michigan, holding a meeting again for Dr. Tom Malone. It was a strange meeting, for I was going to close out Sunday night at 7.30. I had the 7 until 7.30 uh, period. I'd been there since the previous Wednesday, every night preaching, and suddenly I'm going to close out at 7.30 because they have now scheduled a revival to begin at 7.30 to go through the next week. Only time in my life I've ever been in a service where I'd close a meeting and they'd start with another. That's sort of unusual in a church. And their speaker was to be an evangelist by the name of Carl Hatch. Now, I really had not known this particular evangelist, except many years ago, he began his ministry in a mission that we had in Fresno, California, pastored the mission church. I hadn't seen him since. I suppose that had been about 20 years. And uh, I thought, well, my, I'd like to say a few words to him. But if I wait until after the service, uh, I'll have to leave. I, I had to get in the plane and fly that night to, uh, to head on for my next meeting. And yeah, I knew everybody would crowd around him and we'd not have any fellowship at all. So I decided I'll have to do it before the service. Now, he had preached that uh, morning in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And Bob Martin had flown down to Indianapolis to be in the morning service in order to fly him back that afternoon to Pontiac to begin the service there. So I decided I'll just go out to the airport and wait for them to land, and I'll have that opportunity then of talking to him. And that's what I did. I was out in front of the hangar watching airplanes land when suddenly a car pulled up uh, in the parking area right beside the hangar. I glanced over. I saw the man get out. I remembered I, uh, he had been pointed out to me. Bob Martin had said, now, see that fellow? One day I hope we can get him. Well, he was a Catholic friend of Bob Martin's. The man got out of his car, went around behind the hangar where he had an airplane tied down. Then I knew in a few minutes I would see him uh, as he would taxi out on the other side, uh, the little taxi strip, out to the runway and would take off, would fly for about 50 minutes and then would come back. Suddenly, the Spirit of the Lord began to speak to my spirit, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, you know what? Bob Martin is going to come in, and I'm going to have a chance to talk to him. Uh, and so I made plans. I'll talk to Bob Martin and Carl Hatch, and then they'll leave, and this man will come in, and I'll talk to him. But you know, God had some different plans. The man appeared around the side of the hangar. Oh, it was so interesting. He saw me. He waved at me. I waved at him. He came over said, Preacher, how are things going? Doing great. We talked about the weather. What do you talk about? Talked about several things like that. He talked about Bob Martin. said, Oh, you, did you know he was such a terrible man? Yes, I understood that. And now he's had such a change in his life. He says, Everybody loves him now. Those that used to hate him. And I said, Yes, sir, I sure. I've heard all of that. And I'll never forget when he looked up at me and big tears started down his cheeks. And he said, Sir... Would it be possible for you to give me what you gave Bob Martin? I'd led Bob to Christ. I said, you know, the Lord has chosen this very day. In fact, my Bible was in the, in the uh, plane. I'd already opened it to the plan of salvation. And we just simply knelt there with the Bible on the front right landing gear of the airplane. And there on his knees, he asked the Lord to forgive him and save him. You know who won that man to Christ? It wasn't Brother Williams. It was Bob Martin. You see the testimony of that man. Sometimes you don't have to say anything. You ask God, and I'll guarantee you, God will work out the details for you. Now, in the next lecture, we'll take the final part. What happens to people? God bless you.